Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've been out doing some imaging, at least a little bit of imaging. I get about one good night for every 10 bad nights. But I have been doing some galaxy imaging with my C925, the focal reducer, the ASI-294MC, and the Antlia tri-band filter. And I thought I'd share with you some of my experience with that setup. But I also stumbled across a paper that describes how some of the features that we see with M101 may have been created by a fly-through event some 200 million years ago between M101 and NGC 5474. So I thought I'd share both of those things with you in this video today. Most of my hours are on the LEO triplet right now. I'm still about 67% of the way where I would normally like to be. I'd like to image for between 20 to 30 hours on a Galaxy. And I've only got 18 right now on the LEO triplet. And that's probably going to have to be enough for this year. It's slipping out of the way. And M101, I've got only 15 hours, so I'm only about halfway there. I can still get a few more hours on it each night. I tend to image M101 at the start of the evening until either the Leo triplet or M94 get on the other side of the meridian, and then I swing over to pick up one of those two targets after the meridian. With M101, I can't really image it, at least not with my off-axis guider set the way it is, because I don't have a good guide star on the other side of the meridian. One of the things that jumps out at you here is this gradient that goes from one side of the image to the other, kind of a bluish green to a red, and it's common to all three of these targets that I've been taking. This is just the stacked image. There's no processing done to these at all yet. I wonder where this gradient is coming from. If you look at the back of the camera, you can see that the writing is oriented this way, and that means the long axis of the sensor is oriented that way. And then if you look over on the side, you can see the filter door hole knob here, which means that there's the potential light is leaking past the boundary or the edge of that filter drawer and across the width of my images. So I'm suspecting light is getting into my imaging train around the filter drawer and that maybe I can cure or at least significantly reduce this gradient if I could put some tape around that edge and block light from leaking in. I got lucky the other night and had one good night for some imaging. So while it was imaging, I went out and did put some tape over it. I didn't do a really good job and left one corner of the drawer uncovered. There was still the potential for some light leaking into the imaging train, but I hoped I had reduced it. I only had 1.8 hours of imaging that night, but here's what that stack looks like. I still see the gradient fairly well, and of course I'm comparing a 1.8 hour stack to a 15 hour stack. So what is faint here is going to be darker here. I can't tell, but I'm hoping that applying tape and now going back in and applying another layer of tape more carefully in the daylight, I'm hoping this is going to reduce this gradient, but I won't know definitively until I capture some more hours on targets with the taped over filter drawer. If it's not the filter drawer, I don't know where that gradient's coming from. So we'll have to see if this actually fixes it. I think these results are kind of inconclusive at this point. Now this is the image of Leo triplet. And once you get done processing, the gradient doesn't really bother you. So you can certainly get that out with dynamic background extraction, for example. I'm pretty pleased with the results I got. The Leo triplet is a bit of a challenging target in the sense that each one of these galaxies is quite unique. You need to develop a mask for each one of these galaxies and do the processing on each galaxy individually. The same processing techniques that you might want to apply to NGC 3628 may not work with M66, and what you do with M66 may not be enough with M65. And with NGC 3628, I was pretty happy with the uh, faint blue here and the spiral arms. And the dust lanes are some pretty decent detail and a bit of red here towards the center of the galaxy. With M65, also, I'm pretty pleased with the detail I got out of it. There's a bit of an artifact here, which I would normally blame StarNet for, but I don't know that there's a star there. So I, I have to track down what's causing this artifact. But by and large, I think M65, again, given its size in this field of view, came out fairly well out of the process. And then M66, it is a crunchy galaxy. There's almost nothing that you can do to M66 that's just not going to make it more crunchy. This galaxy has so much inherent contrast to it that almost everything you do is going to make it that contrast just jump out at you that much more. That being said, I'm pretty happy with the colors. I'm getting a nice cyan kind of color with the star-forming regions in the galaxy. I've got a nice yellowish core for the galaxy, and it looks like the HA and the spiral arms is coming out pretty well with this Antlia filter. So by and large, 
I'm pretty happy with the Antlia filter. I was also able to get out and do some imaging with a fairly bright moon. The moon was a bit too close for comfort to the Leo triplet, so I swung over to M94, and I was about 40 degrees off from the moon and got some imaging done, and those images don't look any different from the other images I have where the moon is less prevalent. So I'm pretty convinced that the Antlia filter is going to give me some protection against the moon and allow me to do even more imaging than I would otherwise be able to do if I were using my mono system. Here's the stacked image of M101 that I have after 15 hours. I've been imaging this target on multiple different years and with different equipment. Here's the corresponding image I have with ED-102, a 700 millimeter telescope. Now I've got 30 hours with this particular telescope and this image compared to the 15 hours I have to date with my current setup. So the comparison here is not exactly apples to apples, but you can see at least the difference in the field of view that you get from these two, this water field of view. The one thing that this field of view does give you the opportunity is to capture NGC 5474. Unfortunately, my newfound interest in 5474 wasn't known at the time I took this picture some couple of years back, and as a result, it's just off the frame back up here. So I, if you have a 700 millimeter scope and you're about to go out and do some imaging of M101, try to set your framing so that you can bring 5474 into the field of view. But let's take a closer look at these two galaxies. So here's the 15 hour process data from the C925 and here's the 30 hours of ED-102 data. One of the things that I really appreciate about the Antlia filter, if you look at this HA region up here, it's almost identical to the HA region up here. It looks like that my processing has saturated the HA and some of these other areas, so I'm losing a bit of the red. That's one of the things I'll have to fix when I go back and reprocess this galaxy hopefully with maybe twice as much data available. But by and large, what I'm seeing with the Antlia tri-band filter is that it's doing a great job of pulling out the hydrogen alpha, which means I don't have to waste time pulling out that filter and putting in a dual band filter to try to get the HA in a galaxy. It's coming out automatically as just part of the red band. Now let's turn our attention to this bent spiral arm of M101 and where it may have come from. A couple of weeks ago, I came across this 2022, so a fairly recent paper in which the authors performed a dynamical simulation of the interaction between NGC 5474 and M101. It's the first time that a dynamical simulation has been performed for these two galaxies. And what they conclude is that about 200 million years ago, 5474 passed through M101. Their simulation is actually reproducing a lot of the features that we see today. Now, what are those features that we see in M101 and NGC 5474? Well, the first thing is not what we see, but what we don't see. Oftentimes, when galaxies interact, there is a tidal stream where one galaxy is stripping off stars from the other, and it leaves this bright zone of stars in between the two galaxies. Here we have a deep exposure blue band image of this field of view, and there's nothing in this region. What we're also seeing is this bent spiral arm and this plume of stars that is known as the Northeast Plume. Of course, I'm not seeing anything of the Northeast Plume. We do get the bent spiral arm, but you can see with this field of view, I should be getting all of that detail if it were bright enough for me to pull out. Peeling back down just to the galaxy itself, you can see this bright blue light that should be there, this halo that should be there around the galaxy. I'm just not seeing it. Can the dynamic simulation that these guys perform actually reproduce some of these features that we're seeing? An in-body simulation requires that you divide up a galaxy into particles of mass. There's the disk, there's the bulge, and of course the biggest part of the mass is the dark matter halo around it. This is the basic elements of taking a galaxy apart and modeling it with mass particles, and that's what you can see over here. The authors have put in about 1 million ma mass particles representing M101. There's no dogleg, there's no distinct spiral arms, but all of these particles do have an initial position and speed so that they are orbiting the core of M101. Likewise with NGC 5474, 
for there are 165,000 mass particles. It's a much smaller galaxy. However, if you look at 5474 today, you'll see that the core of the galaxy is actually offset way off to the side, and there's a couple of spiral worms coming off of it. So that's one of the things that the authors talked about. They had a lot of trouble trying to reproduce that, and so it's not really included as part of their simulation here. Now, once you've divided up the galaxies into a set of mass particles, you've got to define the positions of those particles based on the distribution of mass in each of the galaxies. You've got to define the velocity of each of those particles so that you get a coordinated rotational motion of each galaxy. And you've got to define an initial velocity that will tend to push NGC 5474 through M101. The first step is to determine the gravitational influence that each particle has on each and every other mass particle. You can then compute the new positions and new velocities after a small time step. Now, in this case, the authors are using a time step of 0.68 million years, so they're modeling from a beginning time of minus 133 million years until the current time of 200, positive 200 million years, and they're doing this at time steps of 0.68 million years as they go through this calculation. So once you get the new positions and new velocities, you just go back up to this step, calculate, again, the gravitational effect of each particle on all the other particles. Use that to drive the simulation one more step. You'll update the positions and velocities and just repeat this step after step after step. Now, one of the things that the authors did do in order to get positive results they had to cheat a little bit with the mass of 5474. Based on what we know today, M101 is about 35 times more massive than 5474. But the authors found that if they stayed true to that mass distribution, they couldn't get this sm much smaller galaxy to have a significant impact on M101. So they had to increase the mass of 5474 to about a factor of four in order to get the desired effect. That's not the end of the story. You perform a simulation with certain initial conditions and you see if the end result, does that look like what we have today? So performing one simulation just gives you one realization based on your initial conditions of what happened. Here are the steps of the simulation that they performed. This is the initial conditions we were just looking at. This is the condition at positive 211 million years. This is what we would see today. Now, one of the things we've already commented on is that we don't see a tidal stream. So the authors here had to play games with where does 5474 fly through M101? Well, M101 is rotating in this direction. And what they found is if 5474 passed through this side of M101, the velocity of the 5474 is going in the same direction as the velocity of the stars in M101, plus you have the gravitational pull of 5474 on those stars, and as a result of that interaction, you would end up with a tidal stream of stars coming out here following 5474. That led the authors to perform simulations in which 5474 came in on this side of M101, and that way the gravitational pull of this smaller galaxy could not reverse the direction of these stars that were already in M101. And as a result, we don't get as strong of a tidal stream. At t equals zero, the point of closest approach between the two galaxies, it's passing through right here. As we go into a positive 71 million years after the closest approach, you can see that impact point that was here is now rotated because M101 is continuing to rotate. It's rotated over here at 143 million years is rotated further over. And finally, where we see it today, you can see some of the features emerging that we do in fact see when we take a picture. We can see this dog leg spiral arm here, that deformed spiral arm. So that feature seems to be coming out. And we also see this northeast plume of stars that started out as stars that were over here, but because they were disturbed by the passage of the galaxy and because the galaxy M101 is continuing to rotate, that area of stars just got thrown out off to the side, off to the northeast, and that's why we have a northeast plume. The simulation that the authors have performed is capturing some of these essential big-scale features of 5474 and M101. These red particles are the ones that end up in what's called the northeast plume. So this is the image of M101 that we have today. The red-colored mass particles are the ones corresponding to the northeast plume. At the time of impact, those stars were a standard part of the M101 disk, but after the interaction, you can see it created this, the northeast plume. But now if you go forward 
1.3 billion years, eventually that northeast plume is going to be a ring, and then there'll be a second fainter ring going around the outside of M101. M101 is going to look quite different in 1.3 billion years, if any of us care. I've been pretty pleased with using the Antlia tri-band filter. I am getting this strong gradient across the frame, but I suspect that it's light leaking around the filter drawer and into the imaging train. I've been very pleased with the tri-band filter in terms of its ability to pull out HA. As part of this process of getting back into one-shot color camera imaging, I've forgotten how convenient it is. I know there's a lot of advantages and a lot of things I do enjoy about my mono system, but one of those things is not convenient. With a one-shot color camera, I'm using one filter, I have one master flat, and I have a simplified imaging sequence without having to worry about specifying which filter and how much exposure and different gains. It's just one filter, one exposure time, one gain setting, and you're good to go. And of course, the image processing after the fact is much simpler. So there's a lot to say with imaging with a one-shot color camera. We took a look at how astrophysicists simulate galaxy interactions using an in-body dynamics simulation where each galaxy is divided up into mass particles. And then they use Einstein's theory of gravity to come up with where all of those mass particles end up. It looks like that 200 million years ago, NGC 5474 passed through the disk of M101, and that's what resulted in a dogleg spiral arm that is so recognizable as part of M101. One thing they did have to do in order to get those results is to exaggerate the mass of 5474 by a factor of four. So there's still some work to be done to truly understand how 5474 interacted with M101. If you have about a 700 millimeter scope and you're imaging M101, try to frame your image so that you can get 5474 in the field of view. I think it provides an interesting backstory to how M101 may have evolved into its current form. Okay, guys, well, that's all I have for today. Clear skies, and I'll talk to you later. See ya.